logged in. All right, so, um, hi, welcome. Thanks for coming to our webinar uh, where we're gonna talk all about emulsifiers tonight. Um, huge thank you to Shelly Stevens for joining us. Um, Shelly is the mom of an affected patient and she's also a scientist extraordinaire. I'm gonna let her tell you guys all about her credentials, but first, before we get too far into um, into this, I just wanna say that we are we are recording this, so it will be on our YouTube channel eventually. And um, we have, there's a Q&A feature. So if you guys have questions, if you can put them in the Q&A, we're much more likely to see them there. Um, questions in the chat are iffy if we're gonna catch them or not. So, uh, all right, without further ado, Shelly. All right, hi everybody, thanks for coming. Let me share my screen. And while I'm doing that, I'll tell you a little bit about, um, there we go. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about why I'm talking to you about emulsifiers. So I work as a toxicologist and I do human health risk assessment for my job. So what I do is look at chemicals and compounds that we're exposed to in our diets or in the environment and determine whether or not they pose a risk to human health and at what doses they pose a risk to human health. So I've come across working with emulsifiers before not in the same context as what we're gonna talk about tonight, but I'm familiar with emulsifiers as a group. And so when I read some of the papers that we have on the relationship between emulsifiers and cavernomas, I found it really interesting. And so I wanted to um, kind of dive into the literature a little bit. So I'm hoping today that I can answer some of your questions and, um, we're gonna talk about three topics that I see on the Facebook groups all the time, three questions. So one of those questions is, let me start this. Let's see how, hold on one sec. Oop, that was not what I wanted to do. I want to start the slideshow. <laughs> ah, there we go, okay. So, uh, the first question that I see often is, why are emulsifiers bad for us? And another question is, well, which emulsifiers are bad for us? I'm sure that some of you have seen that really huge, long FDA list of emulsifiers, and it's very overwhelming. Um, and you'd like to know, do I need to avoid all of these or some of them? Which ones are bad? And then the other question or topic that I see often is, how can we go about eating an emulsifier-free diet if we want to? And so we're gonna talk about all of these today. Actually, Darla's gonna cover most of the last one, but um, I'm, I'm gonna start off tonight talking about why emulsifiers are bad for us. And in order to answer that question, we need to look at the data, the science that we have available that shows us um, this is the case. All right, so some of you might have seen on the main website some links to three different studies. Two of them were done in mice and one was done in humans. And collectively, these studies show a connection between our guts and our brain, and specifically uh, a connection between our guts and the formation of CCM lesions. So I want to just broadly highlight what they did in these studies and what the main take home messages are from each study. And I think going through these will then help you understand why, cavern why emulsifiers are bad for us. So before going into the first study, uh, I wanna provide a little bit of context of how they, why they even started doing the experiments that they did. And we need to look at uh, what we know about how cavernomas are formed. So this is a blood vessel. It can be one in your brain and it's lined by endothelial cells. And CCM1, CCM2, and CCM3 genes are expressed in these endothelial cells. And CCM1 or CRIT1, CCM2, and CCM3, or also known as PBCV10, 
they form a complex inside these endothelial cells. And one of the functions of this complex is to inhibit a signaling pathway inside the cell called the MEKK3 pathway. When you have a mutation in one of those CCM1, CCM2, or CCM3 genes, and it disrupts the function of this complex, then you can get overstimulation of this signaling pathway. And when you have overstimulation of the signaling pathway, then you can get formation of CCM3 or CCM lesions. And so um, because scientists are very inquisitive and are always asking questions, they wanted to know if there's anything else that could stimulate this pathway, because this pathway seems to be really critical to the formation of lesions. And that lays the foundation for one of the first studies. So it turns out that the answer is yes, there are other things that can activate this pathway. And gram-negative bacteria and a molecule that's produced by gram-negative bacteria called lipopolysaccharide or LPS can activate the MEKK3 pathway. So what they do is they can bind to a receptor on the surface of your cells. And when they bind to this receptor, it leads to activation of that signaling pathway that we talked about. And so one of the questions that they want, wanted to answer for this first study was whether or not gram-negative bacteria and LPS can affect the formation of CCM lesions. And so they did an experiment in mice and they used a CCM mouse model that they've used in their lab often. So this paper was by Tang et al. and published in 2017. And they exposed these mice to gram-negative bacteria or to LPS. So they had two different populations of mice. They had control mice that weren't exposed, and then they had their group of mice that were exposed to the bacteria or to LPS. And then they compared CCM lesion formation between these two groups of mice. And what they found was the mice that were exposed to the gram-negative bacteria or to LPS showed accelerated CCM formation. And I apologize for my really bad graphics. <laughs> I, it's supposed to be a little raspberry inside brain, but you know. Um, so anyway, they, they found that the exposed mice had accelerated CCM lesion formation compared to the control mice. And so again, the take home from that paper, gram-negative bacteria and LPS, this molecule produced by the bacteria, can accelerate CCM lesion formation in mice. We also know that gram-negative bacteria are found in our guts, and they're part of our gut microbiome. Our microbiome is made up of all different types of bacteria, and some of them have to be, uh, happen to be gram-negative bacteria. So I'm sure many of you have heard about this gut-brain connection, and you, you know that it exists, but don't really, I mean, what is it? What does it mean that they're connected? Uh, the gut, and, and specifically the, the microbiome in your gut, is able to send signals that leave the gut, enter into circulation, and then can eventually reach your brain. So your gut can send signals to the brain. And then the brain, in turn, can communicate with your gut through the vagus nerve. And so they're always talking to each other in constant communication. Those signals that come or originate from the gut and can reach the brain are dependent on a couple of things. One of those is the composition of your microbiome. So this means the types of bacteria in your microbiome, the quantity of those bacteria, the different ratios. Um, those bacteria are the ones that are producing signals. And so it makes sense that the composition of your microbiome can affect those signals that reach the brain. Another uh, aspect that can affect what signals reach the brain is your overall gut health. And throughout the talk tonight, whenever I mention gut health, what I'm really talking about is gut integrity. So 
are the insides of your intestines, uh, um, are they healthy or are they leaky? So we're gonna talk a little bit about a leaky gut tonight and I'll show you some images of what that looks like in a few minutes. But if you have a leaky gut, then again, that makes sense. If, if it's leaky, then things that are in your gut, in your microbiome can more easily enter into circulation and reach the brain. So one of the second papers that we'll discuss was really focused on relationships between the microbiome and cavernomas. And this paper was published by Polster et al. in 2020, and it was a human study. And what they really wanted to do was to see whether cavernoma patients had different microbiomes compared to non-cavernoma patients. And so they had, again, those two populations, cavernoma patients versus non-cavernoma patients. And they did very thorough um, investigations looking at the microbiomes between those two groups. And what they found was that cavernoma patients had distinct microbiomes compared to the non-cavernoma patients. Well, how are they distinct? One of the ways was that they were enriched in the proportion of gram-negative bacteria. So the cavernoma patients had more gram-negative bacteria in their microbiomes compared to the non-cavernoma patients. And then another thing they found was the cavernoma patients had an abundance of the tools needed to synthesize and make that LPS molecule. And so um, altogether, let's go back to the different things we know. We know gram-negative bacteria and LPS can accelerate CCM formation in mice. We know gram-negative bacteria is found in our guts. And we know that CCM patients have more gram-negative bacteria and more of that LPS molecule in their microbiomes compared to non-cavernoma patients. And if you remember the slide from before, that makeup of your microbiome can influence what signals can reach the brain. So next I wanna talk a bit about gut health. So first, let's just define and show you an image of what a healthy, well, a cartoon image of what a healthy gut looks like. So in this slide, can you see my cursor if I put it on here? Mm -hmm. yeah? Okay. So in this slide, uh, up above here, this is the inside of your gut. And then down here, this is your bloodstream. So in order for anything from your gut to enter into the bloodstream, it has to pass through these two barriers here. And the first barrier is this wall of cells. These are epithelial cells that line your intestinal walls. And you can see these cells are very tightly packed. They have these things called tight junctions in between them, which um, really act as a barrier for uh, anything. So it can't, not anything can just pass through. And then in addition to this, wall of cells, there's also a mucosal barri barrier, which I really poorly drawn in blue. And so in order for things to leave your gut and enter into circulation, they have to pass through these two barriers. When you have a leaky gut, usually that means you have a loss of those tight junctions in between cells, or you have a diminished uh, mucosal barrier. So when that happens, it's much easier for components in your gut to kind of squeeze their way through and make it into the circulatory system. So here's a cartoon of our gram-negative bacteria and our LPS molecules. And when there's a leaky gut, um, both, but in particular, the LPS molecules, because they're smaller, can make their way through those now compromised barriers and enter the circulatory system and then travel to the brain. So this third paper, also done by Tang et al., this one's in 2019, they really wanted to look at the relationships between gut health and cavernomas. And they did multiple experiments in this paper. So I'm just gonna highlight a couple of them. 
in one experiment, they looked at mice that had CCM3 mutations. Uh, this was like familial CCM3 mutations. So uh, the mice had CCM3 mutations in other cells besides just their brain. And they looked at the guts of these mice. And they found that mice with CCM3 mutations had a compromised mucosal barrier. And after looking at some mechanisms of how that might be, they found that the CCM3 gene was crucial to maintaining that mucosal barrier. So it was important for helping to maintain that. So when you lose CCM3, you have a compromised mucosal barrier. And these mice, compared to mice without uh, the mutation uh, had increased CCM formation or lesion formation in the brain. Again, because scientists are really inquisitive, always asking questions, okay, well, what other things can cause a leaky gut? So can anybody guess? Spoiler alert, emulsifiers. <laughs> um, and so they did another experiment and here they had um, mice and they fed them an emulsifier, the, the emulsifier polysorbate 80 or P80. So they had groups of control mice that fed a re regular diet and then mice that were fed the emulsifier. And then they looked at their gut health. And it turns out mice that were fed the emulsifier diet had a 50% reduction in the mucosal layer, very similar to um, the mice with the CCM3 mutation that we just saw. And then they looked at the formation of lesions between mice fed the emulsifiers versus mice not fed the emulsifiers. And oh, that's just showing it had a leaky gut. And mice fed polysorbate 80 had a significant increase in lesion formation compared to mice not eating the emulsifier. Um, and so to sum up, what we know from all three of these papers. We know gram-negative bacteria and LPS accelerate CCM lesion formation in mice. We know cavernoma patients have more gram-negative bacteria and LPS in their microbiomes. And we know that mice with the familial CCM3 mutation have compromised gut barriers and a greater propensity for CCM lesions. And that emulsifiers can disrupt the gut barrier um, and that's correlated with an increase in lesion formation in mice. So hopefully that those studies give you an idea of why or what the connection is between our guts and our brains and what we know so far about the connection between emulsifiers and CCM lesion formation. So Darla, I don't know if we want to ask any questions about that first, or if I should just keep going on to which emulsifiers are bad. Yeah, I have one question that I think would make sense to do now, and that's um, when you were talking about, the question is, is that all cavernoma patients or those with the familial gene, and that related back to something specific you were talking about. About the mucosal barrier, maybe? I think it was before that. Eileen, do you want to, um, if you pop another question and it clarifies that? Yeah, let me know if I if it's a specific slide. All right. Yeah, it was, I can't even remember which slide it was. I apologize. We'll get back to it. We'll okay. get back to it. So keep going? Yeah, let's go ahead. Okay. All right. So now the next question that I want to go over is, which emulsifiers are bad? So this is a, a bit of a side project that I've been working on for too long at this point. <laughs> I, I would, I need to focus and, and get it done, but um, I want to go through how I'm trying to get this information to you guys so that you know which emulsifiers are bad. So before we get into that, uh, just to define what emulsifiers are. Emulsifiers belong to a group of compounds called surfactants. And really they just are, uh, they allow two immiscible phases to mix. So think oil and water. 
And so that's why emulsifiers are used in a lot of food products because they can be used as stabilizers, as gelling agents, thickeners, they help um, shelf life, prolong shelf life. And so emulsifiers are food additives that are added primarily to processed foods. So you're, you're not going to find emulsifiers in like vegetables or, or things like that. So they're primarily in processed foods. And as I mentioned before, many of you have probably seen the FDA list. There's actually 171 food additives that the FDA has classified as emulsifiers. And I agree, that's very overwhelming, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. So we'll, we'll talk about that. In order to figure out which emulsifiers are bad for us, it, we really have to take a look at what the available data is. And so when you start looking in the literature, there's data from three different branches or streams on emulsifiers. And the first one are studies that are done in cells or in things like human fecal samples. So these are things that are done in a Petri dish in, or in culture. And an example study would be They'll take a fecal sample from somebody or a group of people and they'll isolate the bacteria from that fecal sample, expose that bacteria to the emulsifier, and then see what happens. Does the emulsifier affect bacterial survival? Does it affect what kind of molecules those bacteria produce, like LPS, for example? Um, another type of study might be culturing, if you remember the the picture of those epithelial cells that line your gut that are all packed tightly together. You can culture those in the lab and you could expose those to emulsifiers and see whether emulsifiers affect the tight junctions between those cells, for example. The next kind of data stream that you often see are animal studies. And we've already seen a few of these. We went through two of them that were in mice. So in these studies, they'll feed emulsifiers, or, uh, sometimes in the diet, sometimes in water, to uh, animal models. And you can look at a lot of different things. You can look at how it affects their microbiomes. You can look for production of LPS, which we've already determined is bad. You can look for inflammation in the intestines, which often goes hand in hand with a leaky gut or changes to that mucosal barrier that we saw earlier. And you can look for correlations to disease, like CCM lesion formation. And the last data stream is studies in humans. There aren't too many of these. And uh, the ones that are available are typically human intervention studies. So in some cases, there are people who have like colitis or irritable bowel syndrome, and they're trying to find dietary changes that can help improve the symptoms of those diseases. And so there's a couple of uh, studies where they've fed groups of people emulsifier-free diets to see if it helps alleviate the symptoms of those diseases. Um, and in those people, you can look also for changes to the microbiome, you can look for production of LPS, although it's a little bit difficult to detect that in the blood, um, but I'm not getting into that. And then you can look at correlations to disease symptoms. So this is kind of my strategy. The strategy is to collect studies on emulsifiers and the gut, and then to define some sort of scoring criteria, which I'm gonna go through in a few minutes. And then uh, out of those studies that are collected, record the key findings. And then um, whatever emulsifiers they look at in those studies, we're going to sco score each emulsifier with um, one of these scores, which I'll define in a second. So the first uh, part of this was collecting studies. So this is, um, this is what I've already done, and I'm going to go through it. I 
started off with a very um, sort of loose literature search. It's not a systematic review where I'm looking at every single study ever published that has the word emulsifier in it. Um, these were key searches that I did in PubMed or Google Scholar, where I used keywords like emulsifier and gut, emulsifier and microbiome, emulsifier in intestinal permeability, things like that. And then I kind of cherry picked the most relevant studies that I saw from those search results. Um, so this is not an exhaustive list. This is something that we can definitely add to if we need to dig deeper regarding a certain emulsifier, but this is just a starting point. So I initially identified about 180 studies that looked really relevant, and then looked to see if there were PDFs available of those studies. Um, and the, about 75 of them had PDFs. The other ones, they weren't freely available. Out of those PDFs, or studies that had PDFs, I actually went into the papers, looked at what they did, looked at the results, and kind of categorized them into those three different data streams that we talked about um, to determine what types of studies they were. And I just want to highlight that studies in animals and humans have a little more weight than studies done in culture, um, just because we, we know more about how animals and humans relate to one another. Um, so it's, doing things in culture is a little bit difficult. All right, and then out of all those studies, I asked a couple of main questions. Is there evidence to a negative change to the microbiome? And by negative, I mean an increase in gram-negative bacteria, kind of like we saw with those CCM patients. Is there evidence of increased LPS in the, any of these studies? Or evidence of a negative change to the mucosal layer? And is there any evidence of bacterial translocation, which means bacteria being able to make their way from the gut into the circulatory system? or evidence of increased gut permeability. So these were all things that were identified as kind of negative and bad and showing a relation to CCM lesion formation in those studies that we already talked about. So I was looking to see if there's any other evidence on emulsifiers that, um, that show these effects. And then with the studies where there's no PDFs, um, I can do abstract screens, so you can get some information out of abs abstracts. And if not, we can, and this is something I haven't really done yet, but I can separate them into those that look like really promising as if they would have good information and we'd like to retrieve them. And you can contact authors and um, nicely ask if they'll send you a copy of their paper. Uh, so that's something that I can do if we identify studies that we really want to look at. So the next part of this was recording the findings. So I know this looks like a really boring slide, but I just wanted to give it as an example. This is a table in a review paper about emulsifiers, and they've already done some of the work for me. So they, they've already identified some studies, and they noted what model system those studies were done in, they listed what emulsifiers, um, sorry, I can use this. They were list what emulsifiers they were looking at. So here they were looking at carrageenan and carboxymethylcellulose. And then they reported the effects. So in almost every case, carrageenan caused inflammation, increased colitis, um, intestinal permeability, bacterial translocation. So all the bad stuff. Um, so carrageenan is definitely one of those emulsifiers we would consider bad. So I'd like to create a table like this out of all the studies I look at. And um, it's sort of for transparency, but also something where I can provide a link to it. And you can go in and look to see where the evidence is, where the, the data is coming from, if you so choose. Okay, so the 
other sort of simultaneous step is coming up with a scoring criteria. And of course, there isn't hasn't been anything done like this before. So I had to come up with my own criteria and I'm definitely open to suggestions, but I just wanna go through what I have so far. So in order for, for me to score an emulsifier as bad, I need to see sufficient evidence from multiple studies and preferably those in animals or humans of a negative impact on the gut. And again, a negative impact might be increased gram negative bacteria, evidence of LPS production, gut permeability, all those things we've already talked about. I um, will score an emulsifier with a, a caution score if we have some evidence of a negative impact on the gut, but that evidence only comes from maybe one or two studies. So not, not very rich database, just when you're limited to just a couple of studies. And also if there's situations where there's mixed results. So let's say you're looking at soy lecithin and you have 10 studies and three of them suggest there's a negative impact, but seven, seven of them don't find any effect. Well, I mean, how do you score that? It's, there is some negative evidence, but it's kind of mixed. So that in that case, uh, it would get a caution score. Uh, Emulsifiers would get a score of okay if there's sufficient evidence in multiple studies of no impact on the gut, or if there's uh, evidence that suggests there's a benefit, and there is a couple of cases like that. Uh, possibly, I really should pick better headings, but <laughs> possibly okay. It's very similar to caution. This would be when you have maybe one or two studies about an emulsifier, and it doesn't really, the data shows there's not really an effect, but you're so limited on the amount of data you have, it's, you don't feel comfortable giving it a perfect okay. And then we're going to have a no data score because unfortunately, um, it seems like in the literature that I've seen so far, they really focus on just a handful of emulsifiers and the others just have no data. So that's unfortunate. So this is uh, kind of what will happen. Uh, all those, all the emulsifiers on the FDA list will be sorted or scored into these different categories. And I've already started kind of going through this um, based on the studies that I've looked at so far. And what I'll do is put this in a format that's easier for you to view. I'll probably have uh, a list of emulsifiers probably in alphabetical order with one of these little dots or scores next to each one so that you can see. Um, maybe I'll group them where we have all the bad ones together, all the okay ones together. Um, and so this is a, a work in progress. Uh, I've gone through, I don't know, maybe 40 out of my 75, maybe 45 out of my 75 studies so far. And, um, and this, is, this is what I've got. So I will have to go back and do more literature searches if I don't have any data on an emulsifier because I want to go in and make sure that I'm not missing something. Um, so in the end, and I just want to put this as a disclaimer of what this scoring does not tell you. It doesn't tell you if the data is from bad science. So I am not doing study evaluations so I do those for my job. I uh, evaluate the quality of studies. But for this, I'm not looking to see whether they had proper controls and whether the experiments were designed properly. Um, all of that would take a lot of effort and it's not out of the cards, but it's not something I'm doing initially. Um, another thing these scores won't tell you is whether there's data that was missed. So. I mentioned that my literature searches were kind of cherry picked and that it's not systematic, it's not comprehensive. Um, it's possible that I could miss some studies on emulsifiers. 
uh, I do have alerts set up in some search engines. So anytime a paper is published that has the word emulsifier in it, I get an alert. And um, I get emails of lists of emails of those almost on a daily basis. Uh, so I, I do try to continuously screen the literature. Um, but that's always a possibility. And the other thing is to note is that this information is really limited by the data that's available. And it's kind of frustrating where some emul emulsifiers, we just have no data. So I can't tell you whether they're good or bad. Um, and hopefully uh, in the future, we'll keep getting more data available on those. All right. So that's the end of my part. So hopefully, I've shown you why emulsifiers are bad for us based on the data that we've seen in mice and humans and uh, an idea of how I'm trying to come up with a, a method to score emulsifiers so that when you're going shopping and you're looking at ingredients on food labels, you can look and see, oh, that, that emulsifier has a red dot. That one I should definitely avoid. Um, so that, that's kind of my my goal is to sort of help you um, avoid those that are the worst and maybe not worry about the ones that we just, uh, that don't seem too bad. So you're muted, Darla. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Shelly. All right, um, I'm gonna hit a few of these questions now. There's a lot of questions um, that probably are outside of the scope of Shelly or I to answer, but the ones that we can't answer, we will do our best with. Um, so I did figure out the first question. It was about um, the, the study that said uh, CCM patients have increased gram negative bacteria. Um, and so Eileen was asking, is that all cavernoma patients or just those with the familial gene? Um, I'd have to go back and look to see what population, um, what population of cavernoma patients they looked at. I actually no, they looked at both familial and sporadic. Okay. Um, yep, they looked they looked at both in that study. Got it. I didn't. I, I'm. I do not recall. So I'm glad you did. Yep. Uh, all right, let's see. This, I think we can probably knock this one out. Um, vegetable gelatin capsule, emulsifier or no? I feel like no. You tell us, Shelly. What do you know? Um, yeah, I think that's fine. I yeah. have not seen anything negative about gelatin capsule. Gelatin. Yeah. yeah. Gelatin, I think, is okay. How do you know if you have a leaky gut? I don't think you really do. Um, obviously people who have things like irritable bowel and colitis, they know when they have issues because it, it causes symptoms. Um, yeah, I, I, I think some people might have, they might just say they have digestive issues. Like they might feel like they have digestive issues. Um, and it, and that could be due to inflammation and, problems like that in the gut, but I, I don't know as though you would necessarily know. Yeah. And I would say that's maybe a question for your doctor because they may have ways to answer that. And I wouldn't hundred percent know that. So maybe check with your doctor. They may be able to tell you. Um, all right, we did this one. So, um, lots of questions about whether or not this relates to, um, familial or sporadic or the three all right i think we covered that one if your mucosal barrier is damaged can it be repaired i the answer to that is generally yes um mm -hmm. you can it can get better um, yep. um i see a couple of questions um Oh, this is a good question, Liz. <laughs> Given the evidence on carrageenan that's so compelling, why is it still allowed to be in our food? Excellent question. Yeah, very good question. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we know either, but it's a very good question. Um, all right. 
Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to, we'll hit some more of these questions at the end, but I'm going to just go ahead. Do you mind stopping your share and then I'll start mine? So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, food and how we go about finding foods that, um, how, how do we eat and not make ourselves, you know, bananas with all of this? So I'm going to share my screen. No, nope, that's not what I'm trying to do. That's what I'm trying to do. All right. So um, I realized I did not introduce myself. I apologize. I am um, Darla Clayton, and I work for Angioma Alliance as uh, in the community relations area. And I also have CCM2, and sort of both of my kids. So um, I just wanted to quickly go over who I am uh, and also who I'm not. So um, I, I love to cook. I'm an absolute foodie. And then uh, I'm not a dietitian or a nutritionist. So this is definitely coming from um, the perspective of someone who avoids emulsifiers in my own diet and my family's diet, um, but not someone who is a professional in this domain at all. So um, hopefully that's helpful information. So we're gonna talk a little bit about food and inevitably, I'm going to say some things that I say all the time. So if you've come to CCM 101, I've probably said this, you've probably heard me say this. Um, I feel like the most important thing to think about when, uh, when we're talking about this is that uh, it's something you can do. And there's so much um, when we live with cavernous malformations that we cannot do. We can't control. So many things are outside of our control with this illness. Um, but you can you can do something about what you're putting into your body. And so for me, having something that I can have some control over is hugely important, um, both for the fact that I do believe it's going to make us better, but also because um, that feeling of control makes me feel a little more um, sane about all of this. So that's the one piece of that. And the other thing is that honestly, uh, and I'm sure you guys gathered this from from what Shelly was talking about. This these additives, many of them are are not good for anybody's gut, um, and so really, there's there's no harm in not eating carrageenan anymore. It seems to do nothing good for us, um, and several things that are bad for us. So really, at the end of the day, even if even if it doesn't help with cavernomas, it's not good for you to eat this stuff. So taking it out of your diet is probably for the best, regardless. So that's my soapbox about that. Um, I just wanna talk a little bit about food in general. And so there's, we talk about a dose effect when it comes to emulsifiers. And what that means is um, there, it matters how much you eat. So if you have some carrageenan, um, a, you know, in a little bit of ice cream today, and that's the only carrageenan you eat all week, the odds of it having a significant detrimental effect are lower than if you eat something with carrageenan in it several times a day, every day. So we don't have specific numbers on that. So we can't say how much carrageenan is safe, but what we can say is if you can eliminate some of it from your diet, that's better than doing nothing. So even if you can't be 100% perfect, um, with your emulsifier free diet or emulsifier reduced diet, by all means, doing something is better than doing nothing. Um, I wanted to talk about eggs because eggs come up all the time. Um, there is lecithin in egg yolks. It is a hot topic because lecithin is an emulsifier. I, my, I believe most of us don't stress too much about eggs, um, although we may avoid lecithin in other ways. So personally, I eat eggs. I know a lot of other folks that eat eggs. Some people do not eat eggs, and that is a personally that is a personal choice, and it's a valid choice. But um, we don't. Most of us don't stress a whole lot about eggs. Um, and I don't know, Shelley, have you looked at eggs? Yeah, there's um, only one study that I know of that compared eggs to soy and sunflower lecithin. It was, it was a study in cells, 
So it wasn't that <laughs> it wasn't that great. Um, and yeah, I I have found no data, and I've I've actually looked to try to find something negative, but I have I haven't really found any data suggesting that eating eggs or natural lecithin has is bad at all. And in fact, um, lecithin helps in the production of some amino acids or something. So I, I think it's it's fine to get it from eggs. Yeah. And that's that's basically the same thing. We we've spent a lot of time trying to research eggs and um we couldn't get a straight answer, but everything we we were finding seemed to suggest that the health benefits of eggs outweigh the potential risks of the lecithin. Now, if you do decide you want to eliminate eggs, um, there is no lecithin in the egg white. So you can still have egg whites uh, if you decide you want to avoid that lecithin that's in the yolks. This is my super basic tip about um, avoiding emulsifiers, shop the outside of the store. So typically that's like the produce section, the meat and uh, seafood section, and then the dairy section. The dairy section, you can't always trust that one, but the meat is typically clean. And then um, especially if it has no ingredient label, that seems to be the key. No ingredient label to read the ingredients on is usually a good sign. So if you you know, pick up an apple, pick up some broccoli, the ingredient is broccoli, you're good. The ingredient is apples. It's okay. So shopping that outside of the store produce is as long as it's not going not processed produce um, is going to be okay. Most meat is okay. Plain dairy is okay. So like two percent milk. I've never seen anything added to two percent milk. I have seen things added to cream. Be careful with heavy cream. That's a sneaky one. I honestly just thought if the label says it's heavy cream, that's all that would be in it. That is not true. Um, but there are certain brands of heavy cream that are clean, although surprisingly, most of them are not. Organic options can be helpful. So if you're you know, on the hunt for something and you, you really want to put ricotta cheese in a recipe and you all the ones you're flipping around say that they have xanthan gum in them, um, if they have an organic one, it's more likely to be clean, um, no promises, but every now and then the organic option is the flip. So actually at Trader Joe's, if you're looking for heavy cream, the organic option has um, an emulsifier in it and the non-organic one is clean, very strange. Um, so we also have a list on our website that Shelly has spent a lot of time working on over uh, the last year-ish and it is, huge lots of it's very nicely categorized so if you're looking for like i really need to find a bread or i really need to find salad dressing you can go to the salad dressing section and then see what's listed there and find some that will work for you hopefully so what can you eat first of all i know it's super easy to get really stressed up stressed out about this topic and really caught up and feel like you can't eat anything and that's frustrating and it doesn't feel good. And it, it's also um, not really true because I, although I know it's overwhelming, there is still tons of stuff you can eat. You just might need to get creative about some things some of the time. So I'm gonna make a really simple meal suggestion. And then if you guys have simple meal suggestions and you wanna pop them in the chat, feel free. So this is my, a super simple meal. You're just gonna bake some chicken, steam some broccoli, um, cook some rice and put a pat of butter on top and that, should be emulsifier free though i can't imagine any of those things having emulsifiers in them um, actual natural butter is clean in all of the butters that i have checked but uh, like margarines and those kinds of things are definitely iffy so another option might be um, a sweet potato a grilled pork chop barbecue sauce is usually clean in my experience but check the label you can't always trust sauces sauces are tricky um, and then a side of green beans, that should be clean too. So like basic food, just food that you that isn't pre-prepared and doesn't have a bunch of like a long ingredient list in the store is usually clean. Uh, we have, oh here, homemade veggie burgers. This one has sweet potato, black beans, rolled oats and spices. That sounds delicious with pico de gallo on top. Thanks, Liz, that sounds super yummy. Um, and then 
Melinda says she's found more emulsifier free package items at Trader Joe's than anywhere else. I was totally at Trader Joe's today and I found chocolate milk, you guys. Chocolate milk. I have never found chocolate milk before. I was very excited. It has made my day. Um, oh, things labeled Whole30 don't have carrageenan. and that's good to know too. Thanks, Ann. Um, so basic food usually is going to be fine. Um, if it doesn't have an ingredient list, it doesn't have funky ingredients added to it. So how do you substitute? I don't know about you guys. I like to cook. Finding things that are clean alternatives are important to me because um, there are some things I found that I there just isn't a clean, there's no clean version. Um, I will say I almost always can find a clean version, but there's a couple of things that have stumped me. Um, so one of those things is uh, evaporated milk, which I used to use all of the time, evaporated milk always has carrageenan even in organic there i have not found one that is clean um but one of the things that you can do um is a powdered milk so you can use regular like a, a cup of milk so if the recipe calls for a cup of milk i would pour a cup of milk into my or a little less than a cup of milk into my measuring cup and then i would put a scoop or two of evaporated um like dry milk not evaporated milk in a can because no good um but dry milk put a couple scoops in it just kind of makes the milk super powered so it's like extra milky milk and that seems to be a good alternative for uh, evaporated milk in recipes i have found that works great in all recipes that i have wanted to use um, that can evaporated milk in so that's one way to do it um Cream cheese is another one. There's not, there's a few alternatives. They are on the list, but they can be tricky to get your hands on. Um, and I have an alternate recipe for that where I use yogurt and mascarpone cheese and I whip them together. And it's quite good. My, my children will say it's a, an acceptable substitute to cream cheese on their bagels and they're picky people. Um, so generally speaking, I would say your recipe won't flop if you substitute. Um, and remember, there's a dose effect. So like if you are making something that you have always used a can of evaporated milk in and you're convinced that that recipe will not work any other way, go ahead and use the can of evaporated, evaporated milk as long as you're not doing it every single day, all day long. It's not going to be the end of the world to have it every now and then. All right, so reading labels. Um, once you kind of get into this, you, you've got to learn to read labels. And I think it's important to recognize that reading labels is a skill and that skills take time to master. So be kind to yourself, be gentle. This is not going to be something that you're going to go to the grocery store and feel like you're a pro the first time you do it. Um, you're probably going to feel overwhelmed. A lot of us that do this find actually shopping online is helpful because um, I don't like to stand there and look at everything in the store. I feel like people are giving me the side eye. So um, if you can shop at home and then you can kind of look at your ingredients a little more carefully at home, that might make it easier at first. Um, I usually start from the bottom and read upwards because a lot of times those emulsifiers that there'll be additives that they stick in at the at the end because there's smaller amounts of them go in. So you know if I pick up a pick up something and xanthan gum is the you know second to last ingredient, I know I can just put it right back and pick up another one and see if that version is clean. So that seems to make it take a little bit less time. Um, I also have some tried and true foods that I buy every time I go to the store. I know they're clean. They're things that my kids will eat, things that we like. And um, and so once you get in the habit of checking, I know I check. Um, one of the ones that I buy a lot is the um, sourdough bread from Aldi's. It is delicious and, and it's clean. So if I go to Aldi, I, I know I can grab the sourdough bread and not have to check that label. That being said, um, you should probably check them from time to time because they companies change what they put in food. And we actually had to um, had to change our cookbook one year because they had changed the ingredients that they put in one of the sauces that were in a recipe. So the other thing I wanted to mention is um, the Fig app, which our community member Nicole Clayton found and was sharing with us on our um, Facebook group recently. It is a really cool app. 
it lets you put in a list of emulsifiers and then when you go to go to the grocery store you can scan um, labels and it will tell you if the things on your list are in that food it's not perfect not everything is is part of the app yet but it it's a good start and it's nice to be able to just scan it and it'll say like um, it gives you a red yellow green sort of option so it'll give you a like red that's that's definitely a no that one has polysorbate 80 put it back um, and that makes it a little easier for me when i'm shopping so that's worth checking out and we can kind of look at that list that shelly's working on and kind of put the two things together in a way that's meaningful so we'll kind of work on that as our as we move forward um, foods that are always clean i talked about this a little bit fresh produce and then i'm going to say almost always fresh meats and seafood every now and then someone might add something a little funky um, regular milk just plain old milk should be clean um, those are the things that i don't i don't check at all i really don't if i'm going to grab some chicken and broccoli and a gallon of two percent milk i don't check any of those things i'll just pipe in that you have to be careful of marinated meats though yes that's a good point it's a good like our grocery store has this whole section of all these great tasting marinated meats and then you look at the ingredients and there's emulsifiers in the marinades almost always um, merit like and it's not xanthan gum ma'am um all right so things that are usually clean hard cheeses are usually clean plain yogurt is usually clean tortilla chips are almost always clean um fresh bread not the kind that's in a package but the kind that the store made that day that's intended to be eaten that day and will go into you know become croutons that night and not be served again that kind of stuff is usually clean um these are the ones that you know you kind of have to look a little more carefully non-dairy milks um those nut milks are almost always almost always have something funky in them um packaged baked goods so um you know if you're gonna go get some powdered donuts you're probably going to need to check that label real carefully. Um, sliced bread is iffy. Um, bagels, all of, all that kind of stuff that's in that bread aisle, you probably want to check that. Um, all, you know, those like lunchbox things that you throw in the little Debbie sorts of things, probably want to check those dairy products ricotta cheese is one that i it can be really fine and it can be really really weird um one of the ones i picked up once at all these has three different emulsifiers in it three um but most of the I, half of the time it has no emulsifiers so ricotta cheese check the label on that one cream cheese i've never found like a boxed cream cheese in the store i've never picked one up that's clean even the organic ones they all have some kind of junk added to them flavored yogurt is iffy um chocolate milk i found one tonight that's the first one i've ever found i was very excited sour cream um regular sour cream is usually clean uh light sour cream is sometimes iffy um Salad dressings are uh, often have additives. You know how salad dressings should be sort of separate if it's an oil and vinegar salad dressing, you should see that separation. If you don't see that separation, it's because they've added something to keep them combined. Frozen treats like ice cream and popsicles, which shocked me because I just thought popsicles were like frozen liquid, but they definitely add, um, add something to keep Give them that like nice smooth mouth feel that popsicles tend to have that is uh that's an that's an emulsifier that does that all right how do we dine out um first i'm going to say again that that dose effect principle matters so if you want to go out for dinner and and not stress about it once in a while i feel like that's a very reasonable thing to do um restaurants that cook actual food and aren't like reheating packaged stuff a lot of what they make is probably clean pizza i was talking with someone recently about pizza pizza that's made in a pizza shop with dough that they made in the shop and stretch the dough and put it on the thing and they put some sauce on it um, that they've made and mozzarella cheese which is usually clean 
is probably clean. Like most of the things that go into pizza, as long as it's not, um, you know, a pizza that you bought from the frozen food section, most of that stuff should be okay. We also checked out Chipotle and it is shockingly clean, um, even their tortillas. So Chipotle is a, a reasonable place if you're looking for a fast food option and you're in a hurry. Chipotle seems to be pretty good. And if you guys have other suggestions, feel free to throw them into the chat where you find that you can dine out and not worry too much. All right, so where do you go to talk about this, to get help with this? Um, I know it can be super overwhelming. We are a giant community here to help and here to talk about this and help each other out. So lean on us. We're, we're more than happy to work together. Uh, we have our private Facebook group. If you're not part of it, I will um, drop that into the chat but definitely worth checking out our private Facebook group. Frequently people will say, is this safe? Is this okay? Can I eat this? Should I eat this? Um, we have lots of conversations about emulsifiers and we're happy to continue to have them. We also have that great list on the website that I was mentioning earlier. And then you can also help the community by adding foods that you find to the list. So if you find like a really fantastic granola bar or something, you can enter in the information on this web form that um, Liz Friedman and Shelly Stevens worked on, which is awesome, and enter the food in, and then it will get added to the list for everybody else to have access to. And then we also have a cookbook, which I can pop into the chat, that um, what our newest version is on the way. It's almost done, looking great. Um, but for now, we have our old version, which is available on our um, in our old shop, which I'll pop over in a minute. So worth checking out. Uh, I feel like the cookbook, the nice thing about it is it sort of shows you that, that you really don't have to be super limited. There's tons of really, really good recipes that sort of run the gamut of different types of food. And I kind of like, I like that it makes you feel like, oh my gosh, maybe I don't have to be as limited in what I eat as I thought I did. So I think that's my last slide. All right. So we are, we're at our hour, but we're, we're gonna do go through the Q and A's, but I know if anyone has to leave, uh, we totally understand. So let's look at these Q and A's. Um, I've been trying to type some answers. <laughs> oh, good, thank while you. You're, while you were talking. Um, I, I'm on the website, I can grab a link to our food list. Oh, and perfect. That would be great. Should I put it in the chat? Yes, that would be awesome. Okay, let me do that. So are there foods that are usually bad? Um, yes. So ice cream is usually bad, but there are emulsifier free versions. Um, organic products are often better, but not always. And and I like I was saying, I've there's only really only one thing that I have not found some kind of viable alternative for, and that's the um, evaporated milk, which I have found a substitution instead of, you know, a, a product that I can buy at the store. But there are ice creams, Turkey Hill ice cream, if you happen to have Turkey Hill ice cream uh, in your vicinity is one. Um, there are several other ice creams that are clean. So uh, there are several um, salad dressing. Salad dressing is another one that can be tricky, but there are several salad dressings and it's, it's also fairly easy to make salad dressing if you are someone who likes to cook. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, so Darla, I have, um, I just posted a link of the food list and I also have a, I also have a slide that shows what the new data entry form will look like. I don't know if you want Sure, sure. Yeah, if you want to show it, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, hold on. Move all the stuff. Is it showing up or no? Yes. Okay. Um, let me make this big. Okay. So the current food list is found, if you go into the main website and you type in microbiome in the search, search bar, it'll come to this page. And then there's a little blurb about emulsifiers. And then way down here, there's this link, list of emulsifier free foods. And if you click on that, 
then it comes up with this um, Word document. And this is just a snapshot of what some of it looks like. So it's got the food categories. Um, we have it all like separated by bread products and dairy products and all that kind of stuff. And it shows a picture, a link of where you can find information, nutritional information. And then this row is um, to specify if like only certain flavors are emulsifier free, which is the case for some things. Um, and what Liz and I came up with is a, a way where you can enter in your, if you go shopping and you find a great emulsifier free food and you want to add it, um, we created a um, an entry where you can add that. And I think there's a link to this on the website also. Is that right? I feel like there is, but if there isn't, um, I will make that happen. Yeah, I feel like sometimes these things you have to dig for in order to find them. So as long as they're in the same place and we know where they are. Um, but anyway, the, the entry form looks kind of like this. The first question asks you about what food category it is, and you can click other and type something in if this none of these apply. The next question is food type. Um, and so if, for example, you click bread products, then you know, you'll get this list of various types of bread products. The next question is the brand name, and it's a free text. You just type that in. You can add uh, an image of your food product if you want to. Um, that's always helpful. If not, we can look it up ourselves after the fact. And then just a link to a website that shows, whether it's the manufacturer website or some other site that shows the nutritional information of your, your food product. And then a couple of other questions we've asked, the name of the store or the website you purchased it from, because a lot of people don't have the same stores where they live. And so the idea is um, we're going to create a spreadsheet so that we can sort things and um, you can find things that are just in your area, for example. Uh, other notes, if there's flavor restrictions, and then what country you're in, because I know we have a lot of folks from lots of different places, and it would be great if we had emulsifier-free food lists that um, were specific to different, different locations. So that is the entry form, if anybody wants to use it. Awesome. Um, all right, so Liz is saying, thank you, Shelly, that is super helpful. And I, if everybody, if our community all started using that every time you find something delicious and yummy that has no emulsifiers, then we will, uh, then we'll have a much more broad list for all of us to use when we're going shopping. Um, all right, Liz is saying that people that are dairy-free, there's often gums and other emulsifiers in the dairy-free milks. Absolutely, the dairy-free milks are really tricky. There are some on on the list that um, Shelly was just sharing, so that's worth checking out, but I realize it's it's one of those things that's frustrating. If you're a cookie person, you can definitely make dairy-free milk. I have done it. It's, it's not hard, <laughs> but... Um, if you don't, if you're not interested in the process of making dairy-free milk, they do exist without emulsifiers. Um, will Shelley's findings on the rankings be available uh, eventually? Yes, um, they're not available right at the moment, but they will eventually be available, hopefully soon. Um, is this, I think Heather's talking about peanut butter. We're talking about peanut butter, I think so. I can't say whether or not peanut butter from Costco is good or not, but um, I checked my peanut butter that I buy from Aldi and it's surprisingly clean. And the GIF that my husband bought the other day was not. So, and Joseph is saying Skippy is good. So you, you never know. Uh, a good resource about the connection between gut bacteria and cavernomas. Um, Joseph, on the uh, Alliance website, there is a whole page about it, and there's it links to those studies that Shelley was talking about. That's probably a good place to start. And um, if you can't find that, just so everyone knows, my email is 
darla at alliance to uh, feel free to email me if you have a question i'm happy to see if i can find you the answer pastries and desserts from local bakeries good question melinda i would say iffy i would say iffy um i know i can bake cupcakes and things that are emulsifier free but it's not uh it, it even to do it at home takes some extra steps and extra thinking about things so i'm gonna lean towards iffy but if they're like a super you know kind of organic from scratch kind of bakery it might be okay also remember dose effect so if you want to go have a pastry um once in a while have a pastry once in a while ah oh, the latest on probiotics heather that's a good question um if you check out um i think this question comes up every time dr awad does a webinar for us and i'm going to defer to him on that so if you check out the most recent um webinar that dr awad did which you can find on, on our youtube channel i believe he answers that um my understanding is that uh he does not recommend probiotics for various reasons and um probably that so that's sort of what we're going to say dr awad does not recommend them at this point and that's all i know for sure um ah mozzarella cheese most pizzerias use pre-shredded cheese um so they have what's the additive that gets added into pre-shredded cheese it is cellulose if i'm not mistaken how do we feel about cellulose shelly sorry i was on mute <laughs> <laughs> um, i i don't think cellulose is a problem i haven't seen any any studies that show a negative impact of site on of cellulose and also i mean cellulose is i mean it's plant fiber <laughs> so right. it's it's just yeah it's just derived from plants so um for supplements and for example i look for if they're a, a cellulose capsule i don't have an issue with those okay yeah i would agree that's been what i've i have found also so i don't i personally don't use free shredded cheese at my house because i feel like i don't want to eat weird plant fiber in my cheese but i i also will buy a pizza from a pizza place and i don't worry about it there, is any there, ice cream safe for us oh sorry go ahead Shelly. oh there is a brand of shredded cheese uh tal it's at target tal talamac or something yes talam mook, mook? I know yeah. the one you mean. It starts with a T. That one, um, the shredded cheese doesn't have emulsifiers. Nice. Denise, yes, there are ice creams that are safe, that are clean. Um, the one, I don't, it's not across the country, but um, it is the all natural ice cream from Turkey Hill. It is clean. I also um, got a really fancy thing that I make ice cream with. It's a Ninja Creamy and it is fun and it makes ice cream that is clean and delicious and my kids like it. So if you're, again, if you like to cook and want to learn how to make ice cream, uh, feel free to hit me up and I'll tell you all about my Ninja Creamy fun. But yes, check the labels. Um, Jenny's, I believe Jenny's is a, a nationwide they have she has super fancy ice creams most of them are clean not all of them you do have to check the labels blue bunny vanilla ice cream i'm seeing in the chat is also cream so clean so there are some out there i honestly the weirdest thing i never i i looked at a lot of ice creams from whole foods and none of them were clean so i thought that was sort of sort of funny but they do exist you just it, it's again you've got to read the labels uh, the app for your phone is called fig let me see if I can tell you guys what the little picture looks like. Um, it is green and it says the word fig. Um, and it's it's been pretty helpful. I actually reached out to them to see if they would be able to create a list specifically for us um, with all of those emulsifiers that we avoid on it. So far, I clicked on the gums option. And then I added um, polysorbate 80 and, and a couple of other things that I avoid that are not considered gums. So that was how that was how I left it with the fig app. And it is it's 
helpful. Hopefully it's helpful to you guys too. Uh, thank you. Heather is saying it's the peanut butter from Costco. It's only peanuts. Got it. Yes, the all all peanut peanut butter should be totally fine. Um, Kathy, what do I find tricky in baking? Uh, is anytime it's a mix, right? Like so much easier to just grab a cake mix. I they're very hard to find a clean cake mix. They do exist, but um, so you you really have to go totally from scratch. Um, and then uh, you can't you can't buy a lot of the icings are you know, if you're going to buy icing it's going to almost definitely have something in it that you don't want to eat so it's really just everything has to be super from scratch um, frank is asking about sugar and epilepsy i feel like that's probably outside of our scope um i will say that sugar in general is not considered great for your gut so as much as um it's not an emulsifier it, it also isn't super awesome for your gut so a lot of people try to limit sugar even if they don't avoid it entirely um, simple mills has cake mixes uh liz is saying they they do and there's another company beat birch birch something it's on the list i put them on the list they may they also do they do cupcakes although i didn't find their cupcakes to be delicious to be honest with you and then they do a bunch of pancake mixes that are also clean that being said um i, I really do find most of the time it's just easier to make it from scratch all right, I think we hit most of the questions. If there's questions we didn't get to, it's probably because they're outside of our scope and I apologize for that. Um, I think I think that's everything. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna call it. So I'm gonna stop recording and then I'm gonna quickly go through the chat and add anything, uh, any links or things that I promised you guys.